Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Dmitry Levin. I'm the chief software architect of Bayside, and also I'm the maintainer of Astrace for more than 10 years now. Uh, I usually talk about modern features of Astrace, and today is not an, an exception, although uh, it's also a history, uh, uh, the history of a Linux kernel design flow. This history starts back in 2001, when the x8664 architecture was first implemented. Uh, actually, it was Linux kernel where the, f the first universal kernel where the support of this new architecture was added. Other followed later, but yeah. So the main feature of this obviously 64-bit architecture was uh, that uh, it could execute both native 64-bit instructions, but also legacy 32-bit instructions. Uh, this is probably the reason why uh, it defeated uh, the competitor. Uh, but the way it was implemented in the kernel, it allowed to not just to mix the instructions, but also to mix system calls. So you could invoke in the same process in the same 64-bit process, both native 64-bit system calls and legacy 32-bit system calls. This feature was not very widely known, uh, not very well documented, and it, I was a witness of many cases where people were genuinely surprised to find this out. Uh, so what does the Linux kernel API provide to find out information about system call? Uh, for a user space tracer or debugger, you can obtain the system call number, the value of CS register that describes the bitness of the process, uh, the address of the CPU instruction, that was invoked, but there was no API to tell exactly what was the system call. What, was it a 64-bit or 32-bit? So what could user space tracers, debuggers do? Then they needed to obtain the system call information. So they fetched this system call number from one register uh, fetched the value of CS register to find out the bitness of process, and they, they did a wild guess. So if the process is 64-bit, then the syscall also has to be 64-bit. And if it's 32-bit, the process, then the system call should be. Why not? It's quite natural, right? Uh, and then they, like, Suppose they know the bitness of system call. They fetch system call agreements according to this, or, or uh, using the method appropriate to this bitness. And they were working this way. Uh, later, uh, a slightly more fast method of obtaining registers was introduced in the Linux kernel. So Tracer started fetching the whole register set. But uh, the register set sent by the kernel depends on the bitness of process. So from a system called bitness perspective, nothing changed. Uh, and there is no surprise that it depends on the process bitness because debuggers may need to fetch registers for all kinds of purposes, not just for system calls. And strictly speaking, uh, there is no direct link between process bitness and system call bitness, except that usually they, they match. Very often they match, but sometimes they don't. 
So what happens when they don't match? First time, uh, first time known to me when this bug was reported, it was reported again as tr against the trace to Debian bug tracker back in 2008. So there was a very simple reproducer. Uh, so here you can see a very similar reproducer. It's essentially the same as one you can find in the bug report. So what it essentially does, it just prints a string, then invokes this 32-bit um, system call using int hexadecimal 80, and then prints another, another string. Uh, this uh, funny-looking system call is actually a fork. As you can see, uh, if, you, if you remember this, uh, this uh, x86ABI, uh, the number of system call is stored in EAX register. It's number two, number two in, in the system call table uh, of x86 X e is fork. So if you, you can compile this program, run this program, uh, and we'll see something like this. So there will be a line printed, and then two lines printed by, by both processes. It will look like, like yeah, I think, Process IDs will be different, but all the rest will look like this. But if you run this program under a stress, you'll probably be surprised because you will see something, something really odd. Like you see, the line is printed all right, then some process is attached, and then you like see that. You see the, the, the very odd looking open system call with ridiculous arguments and impossible uh, return, return code. What? What? All subsequent system calls look, as usual, making the whole picture very odd. Yeah, you actually can run this program several times, and every time you will likely see different set of impossible combinations of open uh, flags. Uh, so for me, it resembles a, a toy I had in my childhood. A kaleidoscope. Uh, you turn it slightly, and you get uh, every time a new, uh, a new, a new, <laughs> nice or odd-looking picture. Uh, the reason for this is kernel address randomization. So, the, all these strange flags, uh, they are actually a garbage in registers, uh, and this garbage depends on what's left from previous. Uh, system calls, and they depend on randomized addresses and, and such. So it was not the case uh, at the time of bug report, but nowadays you can use this as a nice kaleidoscope. So what are the alternatives? What could user space traces do? Uh, there is an alternative method of obtaining system call information. Uh, so you can, you, you know the, the address of instruction pointer. You can step two bytes back and fetch from that address supposedly the instruction that was used to invoke the system call. Uh, yeah, and then decide on the opcode what was the bitness of system call and, and so on. What's the problem? When you are fetching something from memory, there's an inherent race condition. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, we, we are presented uh, from this PC? I think so. Yeah, big thanks. May I continue? Sorry. Uh, you are like, you are too loud. Sorry. Your slides are not being recorded. 
Uh, you don't have to. They are downloaded on this PC. Right? Okay. Then you, when you have to, uh, to watch carefully, they are not recorded. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So there is condition, it's in, not just it's inherent. Uh, uh, in, later in 2012, uh, Linus Torvald showed a, a very short several lines example how to deceive the tracer in a reliable way. So it's actually not a race if you can deceive it in a 100%. Uh, and you have a 100% chance to deceive the tracer. Uh, uh, yeah, it's also extra system call invocation, but compared to the unreliable result, it's not really a big deal. So, uh, what, what, what could we do? Actually, this problem was known to kernel developers for quite a while, and in January 2012, there was a lively discussion uh, in the kernel mailing list. It started with a RFC patch uh, to propose a, a feature that later became known as SICOM BPF. And during that discussion, they found out that the proposed implementation didn't, didn't take these compact processes uh, and the whole issue into account. So, uh, yeah, and this nice person, uh, he was a maintainer of uh, P-Trace uh, jailer or Petrace and Boxer, they were quite popular those days because there, there, there were no C-Comp. So he was a maintainer of this thing and he was like very surprised. Uh, almost as surprised as this. <laughs> uh, he couldn't believe that this feature exists and, and wasn't almost, almost undocumented. And several well-known people suggested various solutions for the problem. Uh, first was Linus, who suggested to abuse eFlux because probably nobody uses them. So just use two high bits from eFlux and encode the information whether it's compact syscall or not. But then Hans Peter said he doesn't like this hack and he suggested to use another hack and abuse our uh, CS register because this register is less likely to be used, I mean, those high bits. Uh, so his, he thought his hack was nicer. Uh, then Roland said that he doesn't like that kind of hacks and suggests to use Rickset mechanism or maybe just introduce a new Rickset flavor. This would be like nice to already existing programs and so on. But then Dennis said that why not to extend one of already existing rig sets? Uh, then Roland responded that this would break a compatibility uh, with already existing software, like core files would change and so on. Uh, Alex suggested to, yeah, to use uh, a new flag and deliver new Ptrace events. We have Ptrace or Trace is good. Uh, he suggested, of course, to use Ptrace. Trace is very good. Uh, it's nice of him to suggest this good name. So yeah, introduce like four new events. Uh, Pedro suggested not to introduce new events but instead provide this information using Petrace get event message instead, so you can like make an extra system call and obtain this information. Uh, yeah. But as you can imagine, the end result of this was that SIGCOMP was finally implemented because uh, there were Googlers who were behind this feature, they wanted it, and they finally made it into the kernel. But nobody really wanted this feature in Ptrace. Uh, yeah, the evolution of this problem went through all these classic steps. First, people 
said the problem doesn't exist, but you, you clearly saw it does. Uh, then uh, they argued that there, there are no consequences, no problem that, that if syscall is printed wrongly. But then came people who were relying on the correct, um, correct information about system calls. Like if you're, if you are maintaining a Petrace uh, sandbox and it makes the wrong decision, you are out of the game, actually. Then People say that the race was not practical, but well, Linux told, showed them that it's more than practical. Then people, uh, well, quite known people, I would say, suggested a lot of interesting ideas. And one, every idea was objected by one or more kernel developers. So it was a, like a nice uh, discussion, very lively. You can actually find it and read. It's an it's a interesting read. Yeah, but nobody came out with a real patch. So, like, nobody was really interested. Uh, no big clients came to big vendors to request the feature. Uh, researchers were busy researching other kinds of stuff. So, yeah, nothing changed. There was no follow-up for this. And in free software, uh, if, you, if you want to to have a, have a result, yeah, you obviously need, need to find a person who, who is interested, who cares about, and who is able to. And, yeah. I found about, uh, I find out about this, uh, this discussion only in 2017, because these people didn't care to like, like CC, uh, uh, a maintainer of a stress, why bother him, right? right? No need to. So I found out about it in 2017, and uh, I asked what was the conclusion of this discussion, what they decided to do. Uh, to be honest, I didn't expect any response at all, but Andy responded. He said that he opposed to all those uh, proposals made five years ago for various reasons. Uh, they were more or less hackish, so, and he said, well, uh, let's use the positive result of uh, PF and just introduce a new Petrace request that will uh, contain all the information necessary to, to find out all syscall details. And yes, and let's use this uh, arch field that's in secom data structure that describes uh, the uh, architecture of the system call. So if it works for secom, it should work for bitrace. That was a suggestion. Uh, so I asked him how does he propose to implement this? Because the internal kernel API didn't have anything to it didn't have the, the, the most crucial part uh, to implement this suggestion. There, were, there was no way to find out the architecture of another process. You could find the architecture of the current process, but not another process. So I asked him this, and what do you think was the answer? Yeah, this was the answer. It was total silence. Uh, so... I thought I really don't want to implement this internal kernel API. Uh, so I, there was no follow-up of this. And only in 2018, uh, the person was found who submitted a, a, a RFC patch. It was 7th of November, 2018. Uh, we used to work together at the time. So Elvira su submitted the first RFC, and there was a, a follow-up. Very, very, very shortly, Alec responded. Alec is a P-trace maintainer in the kernel. Alec responded, and then Andy responded. Uh, I wonder why Alec responded uh, so promptly. Maybe the reason is that they live in, in the same city, and actually, 
could meet face to face and discuss things. It's actually, I would say, it's very useful to have a kernel developer living nearby. Yeah, it helps. Uh, and in general, it helps uh, if you can uh, talk face to face. Sometimes uh, it helps to, to solve questions. So yeah, that was a, um, the, the, first, the very first approach. In this approach, I really decided to sidestep the, the main problem, which is how to report the architecture when there is no kernel API. Nobody wanted to implement this kernel API. So she decided, let's, uh, let's, hope, Andy, uh, let's hope Andy didn't notice, uh, and we'll just report the compactness of process. But as you can, as you can imagine, the, uh, that, that hope was in vain, and he noticed. And he uh, insisted to implement this the right way, that is, to implement this, this field. So in the end, we, were, we had to, we had to, they had no other options, either to drop the, the ball or to implement the thing we wanted to avoid. So we agreed, uh, well, we, we, there was an agreement uh, between me and Elvira that I will be implementing the boring part. Uh, and she will implement uh, the betrays part. So in the second edition of, of, of the patch set, uh, you can see it more looks like secomp data, that this uh, uh, compact field uh, were replaced with a proper arch field. Uh, also, instruction pointer was added, like in secomp data. It proved to be useful later. But to, as you can imagine, to implement this, uh, I, I had to like, code a lot of boring stuff. So it was about 16. It was 16 in the first iteration, 16 patches to extend the, the API that belongs to audit subsystem. Uh, at the same time, when they started doing this, we sta started finding various bugs. Uh, and when you find bugs, and the fixes are quite small, and when architectures are well maintained, they are promptly fixed. So, yeah. Some of these uh, uh, fixes were very shortly merged, like documentation fixes are merged very, very well. They don't usually break things. But when you do something bigger, it takes a lot of time. Uh, in the third edition of this, uh, so there was some, some changes under the hood. Uh, in the Ptrace implementation, it was quite a lively discussion all the time. And on the API level, we decided to uh, make this field available not just for entering system calls, but also for other Ptrace states. Uh, and for some reason, we decided to uh, add a stack pointer and frame pointer. Uh, well, the reason was that in this trace, stack pointer is actually useful. And well, we thought it's available, so why not? This decision, yeah, it was later proven to be not very good. So yeah, that was the, the first edition of this. You see, it's like getting, getting slightly bigger, but you don't, see, you don't see the audit part of this, because there was no need to respin it. I was waiting for response from architecture maintainers, and for some well-maintained architectures, I got X. But you know, uh, there are quite a few architectures in Linux kernel, and some of them are very poorly maintained. Like some didn't get any commits for half a year. Unfortunately, at this time, Elvira was no longer able to take part in, to, in this project, so all the rest I had to do myself. Uh, yeah, in the fourth edition of this API, uh, uh, after a request of Kiss Cook, 
we decided to report also a secomp stop. So yeah, it's very similar to syscall, syscall enter stop with the addition of a, a, a field describing secomp return data. So this helps, uh, this helps tracer. It, it doesn't have to invoke extra syscall to obtain this information. And in the fifth edition, so it's about a month from the beginning. Uh, we, well, it was me, yeah. Uh, some fields were moved to the common part, and also I had to, to unite these two parts into a single patch set. What was the reason for this? Well, because if you want kernel CI to be involved, uh, they don't really play they don't really do well when one patch set has to be applied on top of another patch set that is submitted. So to get uh, uh, some kernel testing, first I, I wrote a, a soft test, which is actually about one third of the whole patch set is the, is the soft test. By the way, I really recommend everybody who extends API to add a, a soft test for it. It not just helps to test the, uh, the, the new feature, it also helps to, f to discover how to use it. For me, it was quite simple because it was almost the same, the same code that, that's used in the trace to test whether the kernel implements the feature in the right way. So yes. Uh, in the sixth edition of this, which was in the middle of, of December, uh, there was a l small change in the APA, and it was the last one. So about a month after the first RFC patch, the API was ready, and soon after that, I released a trace in the end of December that supported this API, but there was no kernel. Well, some the under kernels were backporting this. And certainly, kernels we, we distributed in BASAC. But other, others couldn't use this feature. This was the, the largest part, the sixth edition was the largest part set of all. Uh, it, why it was the largest? Because well, of this, all this architecture stuff, uh, and because some of these patches went through architecture trees later. So, yeah. In this, the seventh edition was exactly the same. It was just rebased to the, uh, to the release, to the, uh, to the first RC of the 5.0 kernel. It's actually smaller because some patches went through architecture trees. You can see it, 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 it's quite, quite big, a lot of architectures, but, well, about a third of it is, is the test. So, at this moment, it was clear that from one point, our idea to implement this betrays gets its calling for API on all architectures uh, it failed miserably because we found out there is an architecture called Alpha. Uh, it's not really that we didn't hear about this. We knew that Alpha architecture exists. I even had a shell access to a box uh, uh, on Alpha, but apparently uh, Alpha is a strange architecture. It doesn't implement a way to obtain uh, stack use a stack pointer of another process. So in the end, we decided to, uh, to drop support for alpha and, and a few other architectures and limit it just to only those uh, that implement trace hooks. Now, it was about 19 architectures, like, and a few were excluded from this. And then it was clear that the, the, the patch set is like, too big. Uh, it affects two different subsystems. And in one subsystem, like, there is a maintainer who uses 
a regular way of accepting patches. He has a tree. Another subsystem is ptrace. Maintainer of ptrace, he doesn't have a tree, so you have to like submit patches to the maintainer of last resort. And he used patch queues. And the idea that you probably can uh, put the whole thing into one of these subsystems, I don't think it was practical. So, so we decided, yes, it was too big and diverse, and let's divide it. Yeah. So it was divided back into two parts. Uh, the first part is pure, pure audit stuff. Uh, it, went, it, it had to be pushed via audit tree uh, using Paul Moore's tree, and all the rest would have to wait uh, when this is merged, and then pushed to Andrew Morton. Who, Andrew Morton is a universal maintainer who, uh, who cares of everything that doesn't have a, a, a maintainer who accepts patches. So it's, it's a, he's a, a kind of maintainer of last resort. Okay, so first, first it was a, a push through audit tree. Uh, we, are, we were not very lucky with timing because when we decided to do the split, the merge window closed. And you know how the Linux kernel development cycle is. Uh, uh, there is a release, then about two weeks of merge window, and then about six window of testing and bug fixing. And at this time, after the merge window, you can't, you, unless you're a very, very prominent person, you can't uh, submit a new, new API. I was not a very prominent person, so I had to wait. Uh, so we waited one release cycle, and also, uh, also Paul Moore was not really very uh, eager to review audit part. Uh, 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 he was eager to review audit parts, but he was not re really ready to review architecture-dependent parts. So he waited for uh, architecture maintainers uh, to to respond somehow. Uh, so I was pinging these people. Uh, actually, I managed to collect a few more arcs for this. Uh, and finally, when another kernel merge window opened uh, and closed, then uh, Paul Moore was ready to, to merge all this into Audit Next and then to Linux Next. And then when the next Linux kernel merge window opened, it was merged finally uh, to Linux tree. It was, it was May. When the audit part was merged to, to Linux Next, I started pinging Andrew Morton. Uh, I had a hope that maybe he can merge it into a, a one of his queues that gets some testing on top of on top of Linux Next. So I was pinging him. Uh, yeah, the patch set wasn't changed. M maybe I got some some acts at this point. Uh, actually, yeah, maybe maybe a, 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 one patch was. Merged via, via, via arch tree, or something like this. But until until the the audit patch set was accepted into Linux tree, there was absolutely no reaction from Andrew Morton. And only when he, it was in the Linux tree, only at this moment, when another merge window opened and closed, only at at, at this moment. Uh, only at this moment, Andrew accepted it into his MM patch queue. So, yeah. And we had to wait another release, kernel release cycle. And, yeah, it's only, it was only July. Then it was finally in the Linux tree. So, 
So in short, it was 29 commits, 47 files changed, like about 700 insertions, a third of them is a soft test, two authors, also 20 people who added the acts, reviews, or signed buys. The whole process took almost nine months from the 7th of November till 17th of July. Some people manage to do more important things in their lives in nine months. In this. Yeah. But, well, it implements this new feature on those 19 architectures that enable three hooks. The API looks this way. It's a, like, it's a structure. As you can see, it contains this arch field with audit arch value that costed us so much time. You can obtain information about the type of system call stop, which is important because there are no other ways for user space to find this information uh, and to obtain the information common to all system call stops and specific to this particular system call stop, like system call entry stop, exit stop, and secom stop. Uh, yeah, you can find this in Linux kernel headers. They don't have these nice comments. Probably we should add them. Or maybe not, because there is also a, a description in, in one page, so you can find these nice comments there. Maybe it doesn't worth the trouble. Yeah, so back to this first example. Uh, there is no longer problem. No problem. It works.